The truth is out there. It is one of the world's greatest mysteries, Scotland's legendary Loch Ness Monster. So does the lake creature actually exist? Well, if you ask one man, he'll tell you it is in fact no myth. Every day it's flaunted in front of your face. Hundreds of people in the valley say they are hearing voices in their heads. You just choose to ignore it. Belief can be a powerful force. No one knows that better than the people who are sure they've seen Bigfoot. Real accounts. He says he knows who's playing mind games. Rogue government officials that are uh, sponsoring this. Um, also corrupt business officials and um, private citizens. From real people. Hundreds of people turned out tonight for the unveiling of a very controversial statue. Yeah, it really is. The Satanic Temple of Detroit revealed the one-ton bronze statue. It's time for you to take a swim. I'm just excited to see my Lord and Savior Baphomet represented in such glorious Italian stone. I do hope his eyes gaze upon me and that my allegiance is recognized in the dark waters. Criminal court here in New Orleans can be a zoo at times. Drug dealers, pedophiles, murderers, just all the scum of the earth are paraded through the chamber doors where I work as a court clerk. Over the past 35 years, I've looked into the eyes of many defendants, but there's only one person who I'll never forget. Eight years ago, a case was brought to court in which a father killed his two-year-old son and dumped his body in a local park. This case made national news. The bastard was disputing with his baby mother over $4,000 in past due child support, so instead of getting an extra job, he killed his two-year-old son slitting his throat and dumping his body in a park. But this story is not about him. His actions are really the background setting for what happened. During his trial, the courtroom was filled with news reporters and people from his family. My desk as a clerk sits facing the courtroom just to the left of the judge. Looking out, I can see the entire courtroom. During the trial, a man walked into the courtroom, well-dressed, black custom suit, light blue shirt with the most beautiful golden tie I've ever seen. He was a very handsome man, the kind of man that makes a woman swoon a bit. He approached the defense attorneys and handed them a large file of papers, then took a seat in the audience. I noticed his cufflinks. There were two golden crowns. They had to be very expensive. Not to sound like a gold digger, but we women notice these things on a man. So during the trial, the judge called for a 20-minute recess. It was just enough time for me to sneak down the back stairs and take a quick smoke break. As people cleared out of the courtroom, I organized the papers on my desk and headed out the room through the side door which led to a hallway and then to the stairwell that took me down to the back side of the building. I didn't expect to see anyone on the stairway. The only people who use it are attorneys that occasionally smoke and a judge I work for who takes a quick cigarette every now and then when things get intense in the courtroom. Opening the door, I could smell the scent of a man's cologne. The smell was masculine and clean. The smell painted the picture of the person wearing it. A powerful man of wealth and class. When I reached the first landing, I peeked my head over the rail and saw someone walking out the door. Cool, I'll have some company, I thought to myself. When I opened the side door to step out, it was him. So tall and lean, his back was turned to me. A little excited, I let go of the door before sliding the wood door stop in place to ensure that I would not have to walk back around the front side of the courthouse to get in. Hey, how's it going? I said as I lit my cigarette. He didn't respond. You here to help the defense attorneys? This is a tough case to defend. The bastard killed that boy. I turned to check the door and that's when I realized I would have to walk around to the front of the building to get back in. Turning and walking past him, his back was still turned to me. I just figured he was an attorney on his high horse. While passing, he quickly turned to face me in a motion so quick that I thought he was grabbing me. But he wasn't. He was looking at me with huge black eyes. No white was there, just huge black voids. It was so evil and sinister, for a second I froze. Then took off running around the building. I reached the front of the courthouse and entered through the metal detectors. Setting off the alarm as I showed my badge and rushed through. When I got back to the courtroom and took my seat, the judge was just about to start the proceedings when he walked back into the room. 
His eyes were now regular, a shade of hazel. He just stared at me and smiled for a few minutes, then got up and walked out. The judge and I are close friends, and I shared this with her. She said that she believes there have been many demon-possessed people come in and out of her courtroom. She named a number of attorneys who she says all give her the creeps when they come in her chambers. The guy who I ran into was on the top of her list. Police Department and have been on the force for 20 years. I've been assigned to a special unit that very few people know about. I've been tasked along with my partner to deal with the more supernatural type of events that happen in the city of New Orleans. This story is about one of those events. Three years ago there were a number of complaints about a satanic coven operating in the city of New Orleans. They use local cemeteries to do rituals and seances. Along with that, there were complaints about hearing loud dog barks and howls coming out of the same cemeteries. One evening, a call came across my radio about such an event, and I headed over to the cemetery to check it out. This particular evening, I was alone. My partner had taken some vacation time, and I entered the cemetery not expecting to see much. In fact, I had busted the majority of these satanic cults in action, and I knew everyone by name. I didn't take it personally. I'm a Christian. They don't choose to worship Satan. That's their thing. They can go straight to hell. This particular night, I walked up on a seance, and everyone stopped. But they had this weird look in their eyes. They all looked spooked. Now, I figure if you're sitting there in the cemetery worshiping Satan, you should be spooked. So, I think nothing of it. After all, we're in the cemetery at night. All right, guys, break it up. Break it up. It's time for you to get out of here. You know you're trespassing. Don't make me arrest you. The entire group just stood there. Looking at me, but not looking at me. More so looking through me. Or, dare to say, looking past me. They stood there frozen with this terrified look on their faces. Guys, you heard me. Break it up. It's time to get out of here. Again, none of them moved. They just stood there. Donned in their black robes and red robe belts, they all stood there frozen. For the first time, I began to feel a chill down my spine, and I had an urge to look behind me. Everything told me not to turn around, but I did. What I saw when I turned around could only be described as a hellhound. The hellhound had a face of an overgrown Doberman Pinscher. Its head was huge. Its eyes were a deep glowing reddish color. And it was large. Much larger than my 200 pound Rottweiler. What really disturbed me was that it appeared to be ghostly and solid at the same time. Almost as if it existed in the realm between the living and the dead. It stood there ready to pounce as I maneuvered my way among the members of the group. Reaching for my weapon, the leader, a woman named Catherine, quietly said, This is just a warning. Don't do anything and we'll be fine. But if you shoot, it will attack. At this point, I never had any experience with this type of entity, so I had no clue what to do. And I trusted her. For some reason, I did. She then threw what looked like a bag of powder in the direction of the hellhound. A barking sound began to emanate from all around us, but not from the hellhound itself. This sound, these sounds, seemed as if they were coming from below us and above us, almost like from another dimension or another world. 
Then the hellhound let out a sound that was not a bark, but more of a demonic roar. The sound was otherworldly. Then it simply disappeared before our eyes. This was the first encounter I had with the hellhound, but wouldn't be the last. I walked the group out of the cemetery and questioned Catherine about the incident. She said that some of the ceremonies that they hold, hellhounds show up expecting to collect the human soul. It was a sign that the ritual had worked. This job has led me down some dark paths and forced me to befriend some weird and strange people, but I take comfort in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is going to sound strange and extremely weird, but my friends and I have a game that we play called Bathroom Bowl. The rules of the game are that you must use at least 10 random bathrooms a month to take a dump. We've been playing this game for the past five years, and we take selfies while on the toilet and send them to each other. I know it's weird, but it's what we do. One evening, while waiting on my wife to get in at the New Orleans International Airport, I stopped at the Hilton Hotel across the street. I stopped at the bar, I had a drink, decided what better place to take a picture than a good old-fashioned Hilton Hotel. As usual, I proceeded to the bathroom, checked the stalls, and sat down to take a poop. Now, this bathroom was kind of weird. There were two ways in. There was a front door, and when you walk in, to the left were three face bowls. Past the face bowls were two urinals, and they had an unusual number of bathroom stalls for taking a dump. If I can recall, it was six in all. Towards the back of the restroom was a second doorway that when I walked in was open. What it led to, I didn't know. So, I'm there, sitting, taking a dump, and as I pull my phone out of my jeans to take my selfie, the lights flicker. There was no sound of a light switch being clicked on or off. The lights just flickered. Initially, I thought nothing of it, and I took my phone out and snapped a quick selfie and started to search a place for my wife and I to have dinner. Seconds later, the lights flickered again, this time in a more ominous way almost like someone was deliberately doing it. Hello? Is anyone there? Hello? No one responded. By now, I'm starting to get nervous, so I reach back to grab some toilet paper and begin the process of wiping off. Then the lights flickered again and went off. Now I'm sitting there freaking out. Somebody is in this restroom playing games with me. I had been in the stall for about five minutes. And when I walked in, I checked every stall, and no one was there. However, I didn't look through that back door that was open and see what it led to. Now, sitting there in the dark, I could hear nothing. And just as suddenly as the lights went off, they flickered back on. In total shock, I saw what looked like a child's feet right outside the stall door. Both toes pointed towards me. I reached forward to unlock the latch and swung the door open. There, standing before me, was a little black boy with his head down. Kid, what are you doing in the bathroom? The lights flickered again, and this time he scared the shit out of me. He was looking directly at me, his eyes wide open, but not normal eyes. Eyes that were a gaping black void, almost as if someone had dug into his face and ripped his eyeballs out of the sockets. I slammed the door shut and locked it. The door handle began to shake violently, way too violently for some child to be pulling on the door. I hurried and tried to pull my pants up and stand up, and that's when the lights went out again. And then flicked back on, and all motion and sound had stopped. 
I stepped out of the stall door, pulling my pants up, and briskly walked out of the bathroom as I tried to zip my pants, not even wiping my... When I got back to the lobby, I told a young lady behind the counter, I said, hey, there was a kid in the restroom. Do you guys... Have you, have you seen a kid come out of the bathroom? She said, no, sir. No children have checked into our hotel all day long. That experience has traumatized me. And I'm no longer able to use public restrooms. Last month, while visiting my family in Destin, Florida, I witnessed something that should not have been possible. My cousin Lynn and I were in her room watching YouTube while our moms were out back drinking wine poolside. Lynn decided to download a Ouija board app on her iPad. Personally, I am not into that kind of stuff, so I just moved over to the other side of the room while she sat there asking this electronic Ouija board questions. I did my best to ignore her, putting my earbuds in and listening to some music. Her lips were moving as if to ask questions to the e-Ouija board, and her face showed a look of disappointment. Assuming her little experiment was not going well, I excused myself and went to the bathroom down the hall, then went downstairs to talk to my mom and aunt at the poolside. When I returned to the room an hour later, she was already in bed under the covers, which was weird for Lynn. She was more of a night owl. She never went to bed early. I was a bit tired, so I crawled in my sleeping bag on the floor next to her bed and went to sleep to the sounds of waves crashing against the rocks on YouTube. At 3 a.m., I was awakened by the sounds of vomiting. It was Lynn standing at the foot of her bed and projectile vomiting all over her comforter. She looked pale and weak, the complete polar opposite to the teenager that I had just saw before I went to bed. We called an ambulance thinking she must have food poison. The rest of the story is what my auntie told my mother when we reached the hospital. See, my mom and I drove the car while they both were in the back of the ambulance. She said Lynn had to be restrained, and she began talking in a strange voice and in a totally different language. She broke out of the restraints, and then they had to sedate her. She said it was almost like Lynn had been possessed. Her eyes rolled into the back of her head, and she let out violent sounds and roars. Lynn spent four days in the hospital, and she's now back home. But my auntie claims that she's just not the same little girl. Let me in, let me in, let me in, don't be afraid of me. Let me in, let me in, let me in. Let me in, let me in, let me in. Let me in. That sound brought me out of my kitchen down the hallway into the living room where my wife was standing there staring at the front door looking like she'd seen a ghost baby what the hell was that you see that sound was coming through the radio inside of our home the sound of a little kid over static asking us to let him in prior to me going in the kitchen my wife decided to go answer the front door. I thought nothing of it. It was just 6 p.m. It was light outside. 
It was nothing for us to be afraid of. But I was wrong. As I stood behind her, she was frozen, staring at the door handle. I said, babe, what's wrong? Who's outside? What is that noise? What's that sound? She wouldn't speak. I reached to open the door, turning the handle. And as I opened the door, there standing before me were two little boys, no older than 12 years old, staring directly at me with eyes that were black voids. They seemed to have a mesmerizing effect on me. They said, let, me let us in. in. I need to use the phone. Let me in. Let me in. Every part of my being wanted to resist them. Every ounce of my body told me not to let them in. But for some reason, I found my hand moving up to signal to let them into the house. My wife grabbed my hand and pulled it back to my side. Let us in. Let us in now. We need to use your phone. Let us in now. My wife slammed the door shut and went and closed all the curtains and blinds. They were out there for a little while saying, let us in. We need to use the phone. Let us in now. Please let us in. I dialed 911 and told the New Orleans Police Department that there were two little kids trying to break into our home. When the cops arrived, they were gone. I'm very leery about opening my front door now, and I'm not sure who or what they were. I will say that they were supernatural. Do you know anything about these black-eyed children? So I was upstairs. It, it may have been, I'm not sure of the time, but it was. I had definitely been asleep for several hours. And I never slept much, so I slept. I probably went to bed. That was probably midnight. And historically, I'd wake up by six. But I was disturbed in the middle of my sleep by some voices that sounded like they were in the house. It was two female voices. The first part of me was a little nervous because I'm like, well, who in the hell is in my house? I know nobody's here. Or supposed to be here for that matter. Secondly, I, you know, again, I said I leave my doors so unlocked. So you know, oftentimes I would leave the downstairs. There were two French doors leading to the pool bunk, wide open. And my house did not have a back neighbor because that row of houses on the Jesus Field took up the whole block. So you didn't have a neighbor in the back. And oftentimes you park your car in the back and enter through the back. So I'm hearing these voices. Initially, I got nervous. I'm thinking, okay, what is going on? And as, as manly as I like to think I am, I did not run and call myself to action, you know, ready to take on whatever it was, even though... It were female voices. I still had that initial hope. What am I going to do? Should I get the gun? Should I get the knife? Should I piss on them? I don't know. You know, I'm just running a gamut of, of crazy thoughts. So eventually I, I sit there, I sit up in bed, and I'm in this. Uh, these people are having a conversation. I was too uneasy to focus on what they were talking about, but it was loud and clear like they were in my home. The first thing that came to mind after I calmed down was, well, maybe the computer, a bug hit the computer screen, it's a touchscreen computer, so it would come on and a, a video from later on was playing. I just, just run and my, my brain's running. I have, why is this happening? As I'm building up my courage to go to the third floor, I mean, you gotta realize I gotta go to a couple of floors and these people could be anywhere. I mean, I. Go this way, you got a room over there. You go this way, you got a room over there. You go this way, you got stairs. So, you know, this isn't one of those, you know, I'm a skilled policeman where I'm turning corners and all that stuff with guns because you, I have no idea where they could be. But I hear them loud and clear. So I build up enough courage. I go down to the third floor. My office faced the Legion Fields. So I went there first. And I looked down and I saw these two white girls sitting on my lawn. Now, it is strange because, like I said, this isn't the lakefront where you commonly and routinely have cars parking and people jibber-jabbing and hanging out and having drinks and smoking or whatnot. There is no earthly, logical explanation for these two women to be sitting on my porch. The fact that they were white was exciting because, you know, maybe I could blow them in. And, you know, <laughs> and, and have a good 
good time. I don't care what color they were. I could, I, that was my second thought. Maybe I could get the cup at But then I, then a sense took over me, and I was like, why? Why are they here? There's no car. Secondly, there's no parking in the front of these houses. I said, to take up the whole block, so you park in the back. And anyone who knows, knows to go to the back street and park. So I'm looking, and I'm confused as hell. I'm like, why didn't know they pick my lawn? Out of all the houses and all the activity, you know, it, it may be, I don't know, two, three, four in the morning at this point, and cars are sparse, you know, one here, one there, but I didn't see a broken down car, but then if it was, they were stranded. Why my house? Why my lawn? So I'm sitting there looking and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And they're talking like they are clearly supposed to be there. So I calmed down, I said, well, it's just two women. I mean, if anything happened, I could handle that. Of course, they had a rough time sleeping. But I left them alone and went back up because I, being a spiritual man, I'm always thinking and wondering, okay, what's the purpose? What's the point? So I had no idea why they were there. I was confused, befuddled, but I, I dealt with it. Wasn't a, wasn't worthy of calling the police because they weren't doing anything but sitting, legs crossed, and talking like they were sharing a cigarette or something. So I let that slide, I let that pass. The next day, and it may have been two days, so I go downstairs again, I'm having the middle of my sleep, maybe three o'clock again, I wake up, but I don't hear anything. Something just says, wake up, go back to the office. So I wake up, go downstairs, take a right to the office. I get into the room and I look outside. And there is this dog with red eyes sitting on the median. So this dog, this hellhound, so to speak, it was a large dog. I knew the dog in the neighborhood, and mine had just died, consequently, so he was not there to alarm me, to alert me to any strange activity. I'm looking outside, and I see this huge dog, not quite a great thing, but, and I'm a dog person, so I know the breed. This was not a normal breed of a dog. And he had these red, piercing eyes that I could clearly see in the dark, like it was almost light. And he was sitting in the median, facing my house, sitting like a well-trained German Shepherd or well-trained Dover Lieutenant. So that would be the two references I could give. But he just sat there like a trained dog, and he's dangling a piece of food in front of his face. Focused not moving a car like that, he sat there, not even tracking the car. And that scared the lid by me, but it also put into focus the girls. And I said, oh my God, I believe those were two angels protecting my house. Now again, I said, I couldn't hear, I could not understand what they were saying. I heard every word, but I had deduced that these two angels were sent to protect my home. They were outside in front doing a seance or something to put a shield over my home. And I know the shield was there because, again, you have a hellhound sitting there staring at the house. He knew what he wanted to be in that house. He knew what he wanted was over there, but he could not move. So what else could it be? but the protective shield of the angels that were put there days before. And nothing happened after that. Maybe a, a year passed, and that's when Hurricane Katrina came along and put six feet of water in that house. But it's always been a, a, a story that my mind goes back to because of the, the strong, overbearing elements there. Two women, one dog, one man, one house. And I would, I would love to get some insight, some clarity, if anybody else has experienced this, hopefully in those exact orders, or just having any experience with a hellhound and what came out of it, what, you know, if they did not get the protective covering of the angels and where it left, you know, what, what, it, what, what, it, what it led to, which is why I'm sharing the story with you, Black Dark Wars.
After my divorce, I moved into an old two-bedroom home in New Orleans. My sons would come over to visit me every two weeks, and they enjoyed their bunk beds. My oldest slept at the bottom, and the youngest slept in the top bunk. Daily, strange things would happen around the house. Keys would be missing, cabinet doors would be left open. My youngest son finally told me that he didn't feel comfortable in the house alone with his brother. He claimed that when I would leave them alone, his brother's attitude would change and become very aggressive and mean. I didn't believe this at all. His older brother had always been protective and been very loving towards him. That night, I tucked him in and told him good night. When I went to tuck his older brother in in the bottom bunk, he looked scared and said, Dad. Can you check under the bed? Someone is there. Son, no one is under your bed, I said. He insisted that I check under the bed. I slowly lifted the cover looking under his bed. And there, under the bed, I saw another him with black eyes. His index finger over his lips gesturing for me to be quiet. I didn't say anything. I simply kneeled next to the bed and said a prayer, then looked under again and the figure was gone. I sent my sons back to stay with their mother for the next week while I moved out of that house and into a new apartment. We haven't had any such problems since then. I wanted to keep our agreement and share with you in detail the issues and problems my wife and I have been experiencing over the past five years. Five years ago, I was in a trucking business with a partner whose name I'll keep private for your safety. However, this individual was and still is a major drug dealer here in New Orleans. The picture that comes to mind when we talk about a drug dealer in New Orleans is a black man with his pants hanging down looking crazy. This man is black, but he's nothing like what you expect. He attended one of the best universities in America and also was in the U.S. military where he fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. He mingles with some of the most powerful people in the state of Louisiana and this man can be found on the list of many political donation reports throughout the state. He and I met when I was looking for a partner to help me grow my business Initially, I was not aware that he was a monster. However, as we got closer, I would notice how he was prone to violence and extremely paranoid. I finally realized that he was a murderer after a contractor was late paying us for one of the jobs we worked on. Two young black men came to my office who looked like they were straight out of prison, picked up a file with the personal information of the contractor, and two days later, he was found 100 miles away inside his car dead. The car had been burned and the body had bullet wounds to the head and chest. Naturally, I was not comfortable with this and met with him to try and buy him out of the company. Well, that conversation ended with an argument in which he promised that he would drive me crazy and force me to commit suicide. A week after that conversation, I lost every city contract I had. When I went to City Hall to ask for a reason, I was stonewalled. Months later, I learned that he had donated to the campaign of a city councilman in exchange for him taking my contracts. Since then, I've been harassed by the police and street thugs. There are many stories I plan to share with you, but I wanted to give you some background information first. Two weeks ago, my wife and I went to church, as we normally do on Sunday mornings. We parked our car in a lot next to the church, locked the doors, and went inside. It's a Southern Baptist church, so we're inside for almost two and a half hours. When we came out, our car was moved from the parking lot and parked directly across the street from the front door of the church. This happens all the time now. I had the car computer reprogrammed to change the electronic code for the door locks, but still, they were able to get in. That same night, while we were sleeping, someone was locking and unlocking our car door in the driveway. This type of harassment has gone on for five years now. In another incident, my mother, 
who was 85 years old, was admitted to the hospital for surgery. I passed by her house to check up on things, and when I entered the home, I could smell the gas was on inside the house. I walked into the kitchen and discovered that all four of her stove eyes were on, and gas was all over the house. Had I walked in smoking a cigarette, which I normally did, the house would have blown up, killing me. Imagine this, driving down the street and being followed by an ambulance. No sirens on, but just being followed. While simultaneously, your cell phone is constantly getting text messages, so many that your phone cannot operate correctly. My son, who was 25 years old, was ran off the road in his new Ford F-150 late one night while leaving a French quarters. He was driving when suddenly a car pulled up next to him. The person in the passenger side pulled the gun. He swerved to get away, ran off the road, and into someone's house. I reached out to some friends of mine who were in the New Orleans Police Department, and they simply said that I have a major problem with one of the ranking officers. People on the force know about what's going on, and many of them are on the take. I have taken your advice and reached out to the context that you have provided, but so far I've heard nothing back. If this continues, I will have to relocate my family elsewhere. There's much more I'd like to share with you, but even as I write this message, my wife's car is beeping and making the sound of doors locking then unlocking. Before I share this story with you, I need to give you some background information. I'm a former Army Ranger with extensive outdoors experience. I fought in several different areas of the world and found myself in some hairy situations. I identified with the outdoors. Up until this encounter, I can honestly say I never had any fear of an animal in the woods. Respect, yes, but fear, no. It was the summer of 2012. I had just finished a long divorce mediation and just wanted to get away from everything. My father wanted to catch a movie that same evening, so I decided to go fishing close to the city. I had a secret fishing spot in New Orleans East that was always good to me. It was a bit out of the way, but I liked this spot. It was peaceful. I left my house at 5 a.m., headed across town, and arrived at the Little Woods exit about 30 minutes later. The area I was going to fish was on the outskirts of Bayou Sauvage Wildlife Refuge. It's an area of protected woodland and marsh that is on the outskirts of the city. To get to my fishing spot, I had to drive on top of the levee that protects the city from storm surge. After a 10 minute drive, I reached a barricade used to deter people from driving any further into the area. When I stepped out of my car, it was 5.45 a.m., and I grabbed my small cooler and placed my high point forty-five handgun into my tackle box along with my car keys. It was a bit foggy as I walked along the levee, and it reminded me of something out of a horror movie, but I thought nothing of it. The sun would be over the horizon soon and would burn the fog away quickly. My fishing spot was a solid two-mile walk from where I parked. As the sun came out, I got excited. The last visit to this place, I caught a cooler full of fish. Now, a description of this area is needed in order for my story to make sense. The levee is elevated almost 11 feet above the surrounding ground level. When standing on the levee, to the left, at the base of the levee is a train track. Beyond that track is Lake Pontchartrain. To the right of the levee is Bayou Sauvage, a lightly forested wetland area. I finally reached the spot and descended down the levee towards the lake. I sat on my cooler and started to get my line in the water. My fishing line was in the water for about 35 minutes when I got my first bite. As I stood on the rocks with my rod high in the air, I noticed the train was coming down the tracks. 
I hated being caught trapped between the water and the train, so I quickly reeled the fish in and got him in the cooler. The train was still a ways off when I decided to climb up the levee. As I walked up the levee, I lit my cigar and took a puff. When I reached the top of the levee, I instantly felt an eerie feeling. I scanned the area, but didn't see anything. As I turned to see how far away the train was, I noticed movement at my two o'clock. Something was in the water, the bayou. I looked closer, and it was a head sticking out of the water. My initial thought was, what is a black bear doing in the bayou? Then I started noticing things. The head was huge pointed ears like two black triangles on his head and the snout was long and wide I watched thinking man this is a big bear until I saw a shoulder come out of the water and then came a long arm with claws I verbally said holy my body was frozen and my mind was telling me bear it looked at me its eyes reflected a yellowish color from the shade of the trees at that point, my mind and body agreed it was time to get the hell out of here. I watched as it changed directions coming towards me through the water. Its head and shoulders began to elevate out of the water, and I heard a growl. This growl was nothing like I ever heard or felt before. I felt the vibration in my bones. As a ranger, I know what fear is, and this was not regular fear. This was primal fear. I turned and ran down the levee towards the train tracks, jumping across the train tracks, totally unconcerned about the fact that the train was bearing down on me. I needed to put something between me and this thing. I went straight to my tackle box and grabbed my weapon, put my back to the lake and looked up the levee. As I chambered around, the train horn began to blare loudly. The conductor was looking in my direction, his eyes as big as his head. As he passed me, he pointed to the left, which was the other side of the levee. Instinctively, I began to run alongside the train. I felt my adrenaline kick in as I ran at a steady pace along the side of the train. The horn blew again, this time for 10 to 15 seconds. What was he telling me? I decided that trying to jump this cargo train was too dangerous in this situation. If I fell, I would be injured with this thing on my I ran for what seemed like 12 to 15 minutes full speed, and I felt as if I would make it out of this situation. Then I patted my pants leg looking for my keys. I left the keys in the tackle box. I truly had no way of knowing how far I'd ran as the train obscured my view of the top of the levee. I could not see my car, nor could I see anything else. I looked back and there were only 30 cars left before the train passed me and I was alone. Although there was no other person there, the train made me feel safe. Only 20 cars left. I need to stop and catch my breath. Ten cars. I'm thinking about my dad and how we were supposed to go to the movies. I should have been nicer to him yesterday. One car left. I leveled my weapon and started up the levee. As I got to the top, nothing. But I still had that eerie feeling. I glanced to my right and my car was about 50 yards away. So I ran full speed to my car. As I approached the side of my car, I slid to the ground trying to stop. I can't explain the feeling, but my body knew I was in danger. When I made it to my feet and looked back, there it was, standing at the edge of the tree line, nose in the air sniffing. This thing was huge, so huge that I could see it clearly from 200 yards away. I could see the left profile of it. Its arms were long, with what looked like hands or claws. The chest was huge and tapered down to a small waist. It looked fast and strong. It sniffed in my direction and rolled its lips back showing its teeth. At this point I used my weapon to break my driver's door window and hopped in the car pulling my spare key out of the glove box. When I looked up it was on all four legs or arms and moving towards me. I cranked the car and threw it in reverse. I had to focus and drive backwards down the elevated roadway and turned hard spinning my car and drove out. As I drove out, I could see it standing there at the base of the levee watching me. I then drove to the nearest gas station and had a meltdown. I was so full of emotion that I cried and laughed at the same time. I realized I just saw a monster. Until this day, 
I have never shared this with anyone. There are houses within five miles of that location. I wonder if the people know what lives in their backyards. Up next, coming to the stage is Mindy. Mindy, live on stage. Put your hands together for Mindy. This story is how I was stalked and almost killed when I was 19 years old working at a high-end strip club in West Virginia. Yes, there are high-end strip clubs in West Virginia. Anyway, I was extremely wild back in those days and partied a lot. I had a pretty bad drug problem, mostly opiates, but I'd take pretty much anything. My work schedule was normally Wednesday through Saturday nights. Sometimes if I needed some extra cash, I'd pick up a day shift but that wasn't often because men that came during the day were just flat out broke. I had a ton of regulars and a pretty popular name at this point. So my club started to have me do private parties outside of the club where I choose a bouncer to go with me and I dance for whoever paid the most. I love this because it was triple the money for half of the work. Like I said before, I had a lot of regulars who came in on certain days, tipped me very well and brought me a lot of gifts. No big deal. There were actually a few I liked a lot, but some of them were a little creepy and would try to take things too far. I was a dancer and not a hooker, and I sure as hell wasn't looking for a husband in there. Anyway, as creepy as some of these guys were, none of them came close to a man I'm about to tell you about. He was an absolute psycho. We're gonna call him Steve. Steve was a middle-aged married man who was very handsome. He owned a few coal mines in the area, which is a huge deal for here. He had sold them before the coal business fell off and made a lot of money, enough to live a few lifetimes on. Steve started out by coming in on weekends to see me. He would pay for a few private dances, hand me an extra hundred, and then leave. He never talked to other girls, never drank or visited the drug dealers in the back of the club. He would just get his dances and leave. He eventually started coming in more often, sitting in the back and just watching me the entire time. He started wanting to talk during his dances and would pay me very well just to tell him about myself and listen to him. So I did it, it was easy money. And nice to get off my feet for a little while. After a few weeks of this, he was coming in every night and stayed from the moment I got there till I was done for the night. He also started to bring me a lot of gifts, sexy outfits which he wanted me to wear on stage, flowers, teddy bears, drugs, money, and tons of cards. The cards started off really sweet, telling me I was beautiful and all the BS men want to say when they want to get in your pants. Then they started getting weird. He started telling me how he thought about me 24 hours a day and how I was the only one who understood him. He actually said if I would marry him that he would cut his kids out of his will and leave his entire state to me. Yeah, I know, creepiest. One day I got a call from my boss. A guy called and requested me for a private party and that I needed to wear a white evening gown and my hair down and curled with black lace panties with a matching bra. I laughed and said, damn, this guy's real specific, ain't he? He said, yeah, but they're paying a lot of money, so please do it. I didn't think much of it. Guys would request schoolgirl outfits, leather, stuff like that. Maybe this guy just had a little more class than the others. I called the bouncer that I always take with me and let him know what time I will be ready for him to pick me up. We always went to these parties together so that he knew I was safe the entire time I was there. I put on the outfit the guy requested and we showed up right on time. 
It was a huge house in the middle of nowhere. But there were only two cars in the driveway. Which wasn't what I expected to see at a private party. I got out with my bouncer behind me and rang the doorbell. Steve answers the door with a huge smile on his face until he saw the man standing right behind me. He gave the bouncer that I hate you kind of look, but then smiled again at me and asked me to come in. I asked him if he was throwing a party, and he said no, it's just us. I figured you could use a relaxing night off stage. I said, oh yeah, uh, okay, that's nice. W well, thank you. Trying not to sound weirded out, even though I was. We went into his living room where he had candles, rose petals, champagne, and even dinner waiting. I told him he didn't have to do this. That isn't really what the private parties were. He said, well, your boss seemed to be really happy with the amount I paid to spend the evening with you. I didn't say anything else after this because I really didn't want him to call my club and ask my boss for the money back. I knew he'd end up sticking me on a day shift for a few weeks, which meant no money, which ultimately meant no drugs. I sat down with him and ate as quickly as I could. As he kept trying to get my bouncer to drink, thank God he was on guard as I was and wouldn't drink anything. The night went really smoothly with no issues at all, till the very end when he gave me a little jewelry box. I opened it. And inside, there was the biggest diamond I had ever seen. It was absolutely huge. I looked up at him, and he was down on one knee. He was asking me to marry him. And a man walked out of another room. Steve looked up at me and said, It's why I wanted you to wear a white dress here so I could marry you tonight. This guy here is a priest, and he could marry us right now. I must have looked horrified because he just started crying and saying, I can take care of you. I would never try to change you. I got up from the table and told him, Steve, this is so sweet, but I can't get married right now. I'm way too young for that and every other excuse that I could think of to get the hell out of there. I then gave him his ring back, got my money and got the hell out of there. Now, a normal person would have put him on the list to not come back into the club at this point. But I was far from a normal place in my life at this time and really needed the money and the drugs he was giving me. I think when you have a problem as bad as mine, you don't have a normal fear response anymore. He didn't come back in a strip club for almost a week. And I had pretty much forgotten about that night when he finally came in again on a Saturday night with the huge bouquet of purple roses in a card. He left the stuff at the bar for me and then left. The bartender brought it over to me and I opened the card. And it was one of those cards for your wife saying that you're sorry. Which was weird. But on the inside was a picture of his family with a picture of me where his wife was. The strange thing is that it wasn't a picture of me with all my makeup on and extensions in. It was a normal picture of me in my town about two hours away from the club in my everyday attire, sweatpants, tennis shoes, and no makeup. I had no idea how he could have gotten this picture. I also noticed he used my real name on a card, not my stage name. No one in the entire club knew my real name. Most of them thought my stage name was my real name. At this point, I'm freaked out. I actually left work early that night, went home, did a lot of dope, and then went to bed. I woke up about 2 a.m. to a knock on my window. I would guess as much dope as I had done earlier, and it taken a very loud noise to bring my ass back to reality. But hearing that made me sober up real fast. I knew automatically that this was Steve. I grabbed my cell phone and called the bouncer from the club that I always had with me. We lived in the same town. And I knew he would protect me. Now I'm sure you're saying, just call the police. But for me, that wasn't really an option. My house was full of drug paraphernalia, and quite a bit of drugs. And when you're a drug addict, the cops are who you run from, not who you call. Anyway, I called the bouncer 
He said him and his brother would be right there. I took my phone and got into the coat closet beside the front door and curled up into a tiny ball in the very back among the shit I had thrown on the floor. I could still hear Steve banging on the window, yelling for me by my real name, saying he needed me and all kinds of creepy shit. Then I heard two car doors slam and a man yelling something very aggressively. I didn't move out of the closet. About five minutes later, I heard the bouncer banging on my door, yelling my name and telling me it was okay. I opened the closet and then opened the front door and collapsed in his arms crying hysterically. He picked me up and carried me to the sofa. His brother followed him with a gun and a knife. When I finally calmed down, I asked if y'all had a gun, why did you bring a knife? They looked at each other and said, we didn't. The knife was what we took from him after we beat the f*** out of him. They never told me anything else about it, and I really didn't ask anything more after I found out he had a knife. I never saw him again, and after that, I was scared of men for a long time. I guess I still am. I'm 30 years old now, married and drug-free. I'm no longer a dancer, and I have a baby boy that is my whole world. I still have nightmares about Steve, that he's trying to get to me. I don't know what happened to him, but I hope he learned his lesson It will never mess with another girl again. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, some housekeeping is in order. First of all, I would like to thank you all for helping me push through the 1,000 subscriber mark beyond the 1,500 subscriber mark to the 2,000 subscriber mark in just seven days. I am so grateful and thankful that you guys have done this. And again, I want to thank you. Sorry about that. That was my car keys falling. We're not going to edit that out. And... Um, I hope you guys really enjoyed these stories. I wanted to give you a much longer set of stories to kind of serve as a thank you gift. It was supposed to be 20, but frankly, with all the energy I put into these 10 just to try and make them come to life, getting a 20 wouldn't have happened for another three days. So I wanted to get this out to you guys now. So I'll do another 10 more uh, for you guys soon. Up next on the channel, I was able to get Ed, the other lineman from uh, Taylor, Mississippi, to talk with me. And Ed shared with me, Ed shared something with me that was just absolutely amazing about his family's battle with these actual dog men um, from the time he was 12 years old to the time he was 14 years old. Now, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, guys, the agreement with Ed, I had to put it in writing. Uh, the name is not going to be the correct net, it's not going to be the correct last name the location I cannot disclose I actually had to sign uh, an agreement with him in order to get this information because he does not want anybody going to this old family property uh, he is deadly serious about these creatures and when you hear the upcoming story it will be called Siege on Lockett Ranch um Dogman Siege on Lockheed Ranch, 1948. You will understand why he is so cautious about this, because this blew my freaking mind. Um, that's coming up down the pipeline. Uh, also, guys, I'm opening the door. So, if you notice, um, I get a variety of stories that come in. Some from a male's perspective, some from a female's perspective. Some people's voices and accents need to be different to bring things to life. So I'm looking for some people to help me read some stories. I already had one person that volunteered, and she will be taking up on her offer starting next week. So um, I consider Dark Waters to be a family where we entertain each other. Uh, and I'm going to open the doors up for some people to do some reading. Maybe some small things at first just to try some guys out, see what your voice sounds like. Um, can't sound like Donald Duck because then everybody's going to talk trash but you know just something to get you guys more involved um, the next Inside Baseball or Inside the Dark Waters is coming out soon so make sure you put your questions out that you want to know anything about these stories that came up that you want to know go ahead and post your questions 
and anything about any previous story that you want to know go ahead and post your question in this next uh inside dark waters or inside baseball whichever one you want to call it that we touch on i'm going to give you guys um i answer some questions from the last one that came out and then also i'm going to give you guys an update on uh, something that's going on that's very troubling and we'll just dive in we'll just dive into a lot of the stuff that's going on uh, with this channel and some of the things that i'm experiencing for taking so many stories on this channel so i just want to again tell you guys thank you thank you thank you remember to like share and subscribe if you haven't subscribed please do uh, this is only going to get better and better and better thank you guys